Hello, and welcome to Critical Base Theory, episode 3. In this episode, we're going to be talking about what's known as the phenomenon of reification. Reification is actually a concept which we have actually alluded to in all the episodes preceding this one. In episode 1, The Hyperreality of Wokeness, we observed how, in our present social condition, the image of virtue has evolved to be more valuable than virtue itself, to the extent that anyone of any class can legitimately lay claim to being virtuous or progressive through the transmission of signs alone. And in episode 2, we discussed the bourgeoisie's foundations as a social class, before touching on how their behaviour and economic decisions are ultimately governed by autonomous productive forces beyond their agency. Both of these examples are what Marxists and first-generation critical theorists would describe as examples of reified behaviour, the first being the reification of progressive politics in virtue of capitalism somehow finding a way to annex its opposition, and the second being the reification of consciousness, where the way we think is confined to strictly rational economic principles, with the consequences being reduced as secondary matters. Reification is not a concept that Marx himself coins, but if you recall our discussion last week about the bourgeoisie's subjugation to the ends of capital, namely that as capitalists they are only capital personified, their soul is the soul of capital, we can identify reification's presence in his philosophy. The bourgeoisie are the beneficiaries of the system, and because of this they cannot see how capitalism's deficiencies will eventually come to their own detriment. As Marx would put it, the bourgeoisie are confined to a false consciousness by their social conditions, and this is because the material comforts which surround them have a transformative effect on how they interact with the world and the people around them, who progressively appear as instruments for the generation of further capital. This phenomenon, where capitalism somehow encroaches on lived experience, is essentially what the Marxist concept of reification is. The person who coined the term, and was the first to develop a theory of revocation, was Hungarian philosopher George Lukács, through his book History and Class Consciousness, originally published in 1923. His aim was to address something which Marx did not, namely to offer an explanation as to how capitalism, a system founded as a means of fulfilling human interest, decouples itself from human interest and proceeds to become a totalising closed system. Lukács observes reification to be fundamentally the same process as commodity fetishism, that is, the process where an object's intrinsic social value is masked by alien laws which stamp the object of a new social function, or as Lukács calls it, a phantom objectivity, which causes a relation between people to evolve into a relation between things. Unlike commodity fetishism, however, Reification refers more precisely to this phantom objectivity's proactive concealing of an object's intrinsic nature. Now, to clarify what this actually means, Lukács makes a distinction between subjective and objective reification. Subjective reification refers to, I quote, the adoption of a contemplative stance. This is essentially where the labourer is forced into a withdrawn and rationally conditioned state by the productive apparatus which he operates, to the extent that he becomes withdrawn and machine-like by nature. This leads to the labourer ultimately negating the social world outside of the one that constrains his lived experience. To Lukács, any situation whereby a person involuntarily becomes the job which they do is a case of subjective reification, caused by capitalism's reliance on the division of labour. To quote Lukács himself, as labour is progressively rationalised and mechanised, his lack of will is reinforced by the way in which his activity becomes less and less active and more and more contemplative. This contemplative stance, adopted towards a process mechanically conforming to fixed laws and enacted independently of man's consciousness and impervious to human intervention, i.e. a perfectly closed system, must likewise transform the basic categories of man's immediate attitude to the world. Now, what about objective reification? Objective reification refers to this very process occurring at a structural level, with men being confronted by invisible forces that generate their own power. Rather than individuals being withdrawn from the true potential of experience, as in subjective revocation, 
Objective reification concerns the withdrawal of structures and institutions from their originally ascribed social functions and their reconfiguration to the ends of capital. The result being that the structures and institutions cease to be socially reflective and instead become instrumental ends for efficiency and profit. A real example would probably help us here. Consider Turing Pharmaceuticals. Turing were founded in February 2015 to invest in medicines with expired patents. In August of that year, they acquired Daraprim, a drug developed to treat HIV-positive patients and on review raised the price from $13.50 to $750 per pill. This price hike, of course, led to people who couldn't afford to pay or with insufficient insurance arrangements being unable to access treatment for HIV. Marx and Lukács would perceive this to be a case of systemic genocide. Furthermore, they would argue that in order for a system to deny a social good to those who need it on the grounds of capital alone, economic freedom and thus civil society must be upheld by structures that are functioning above and beyond human interest. Marx and Lukács, had they still been around, would almost certainly have extended this discussion to the economic motivations that private pharmaceutical companies have, not only to sustain a climate of fear, but perhaps even to create disasters for them to solve. Should, God forbid, they become more powerful than elected government, one could make the case that reification has served its purpose in establishing capitalism as an ahistorical reality. This, however, wouldn't be true, because reification doesn't just occur at the economic base. It occurs in the cultural arena as well. Lukács uses marriage as an example of how the commodity form has extended to sexual desire, something which he perceives to be the result of capitalism coercing us into viewing the people that we're attracted to as things we should be able to have for our permanent taking. This is a terrible example of what is actually a very good point. You only need to observe how popular culture has evolved to accommodate for the treatment of human beings as soulless objects to be consumed shown off and shortly after, dispensed with like stale Mars bars, to see how capitalism's narcissistic culture of mass consumption has had a transformative effect on how we behave and the things that we value. Ironic, given that it seems to come to the very detriment of those conservative family values which Lukács deems to be inseparable from capitalism. Unlike what Lukács claims about the inextricable link between capitalism and Protestant asceticism, it could actually be argued that capitalism, if anything, has burst this social construct and advanced to posit sexual libertinism as something of a virtue and to present such developments as a form of social progress. If reification wasn't true, how is it that conservatives continue to do nothing about this social decline? How is it that instead of defending the family, or human integrity in general, they opt to look the other way, even when one of their own is seen to have committed a serious moral vice in the public eye? In any case, as intuitively appealing as Lukács' theory of reification is, it wouldn't be wise to take it too seriously. And this has less to do with the merits of the theory, and more to do with Lukács' reason for developing the theory in the first place. Remember that the philosophy of history that Lukács subscribes to accepts the metaphysical determinism of dialectical materialism, which, as we know, predicts the inevitable overthrow of the bourgeoisie. This means that the idea of a true social world, which Lukács appeals to, is based on the expectation of communism, which leaves the idea of a reified mental state or a reified social world to be anything standing in the way of the inevitable restructuring of society in the proletariat's image. Lukács' concept of reification, then, is theoretically anything that gets in the way of the communist revolution, and this is more than likely to be the reason why he describes reification as a direct expression of capitalism itself without any consideration for the possibility that the phenomenon may have existed at a previous point in history and may even persist in a communist society. To be sure, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, members of the Frankfurt School's first generation, reject this inadvertent claim about a mutual exclusivity between capitalism and reification. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, 
they trace reification back to the observationalist foundations of Enlightenment epistemology, which entails the strive to understand the world through concepts which we assume to be infallible. To Adorno and Horkheimer, such an epistemology is intrinsically violent and totalitarian, as it encourages us to disambiguate nature without even pausing to reflect on our own epistemic limitations, the result being that we violate the world that accommodates us through constraining the value of its natural objects to the fixed identities we impose on them as objects of study. Furthermore, in abstracting ourselves from nature, we also do violence to ourselves. Now, as the philosopher Axel Honneth rightly points out, the objective aspect of reification that Lukács describes is contradictory, for the simple reason that you cannot produce a lived experience out of a group or a social structure. Many would regard this to be a simple fact about consciousness. However, whatever your political persuasion, there is a lot of value to be extracted from the subjective aspect, particularly the idea of systems and regulative structures encroaching on lived experience. As Adorno asserts in Negative Dialectics, identities are themselves regulative structures, which have a constraining effect on experience. This is the basis he provides for his argument that reification and identity thinking are one and the same thing. In the modern day, psychological diagnoses are one of the best ways of showcasing the causal power that identities seem to have. If, for example, you are having a conversation with someone who merely gives you their name, you are likely to be freely engaging of the subject matter of that conversation. But had that person not only given you their name, but added that they were autistic, the content of that conversation is going to be conceptualised differently in virtue of the fact that they have declared themselves to be autistic. Thus it seems that the term autism has a real constraining and thus reifying presence in denying both participants a more authentic social experience with each other. With this considered, it is not difficult to see why gender queer theorists such as Judith Butler align themselves with Adorno's philosophy. In seeing identities such as straight, gay, masculine, feminine, etc. as terms which in some way encroach on their individuality. Because any word with determining qualities, which could literally be any word, in theory has the potential to determine and thus have a reifying effect. However, challenging the legitimacy of fixed identities is not an endorsement of replacing them with new ones. In fact, on taking the view that any form of determination is oppression, well, like the neurodiversity movement at the moment, the political framework that you end up with is not identity politics, as is so often assumed with the Frankfurt School, but a non-identity politics, rooted on the idea that all forms of abstract determination stand in the way of individuals experiencing a truly dialogical relationship with the world. In advocating for the restructuring of society around the abstract universals of race, gender, sexuality and disability, Adorno and Horkheimer would actually argue that intersectionism springs from the very Enlightenment tradition which it claims to be resisting. Its positing of these abstract universals, furthermore, is everything they identify to be the epistemic origins of totalitarianism, because upholding them involves subordinating, and perhaps even annihilating, the particulars that fall outside of their ideology. This, Adorno and Horkheimer argue, is precisely what happened in Germany during the Second World War, when in a world of mass series production, stereotypes replaced individual categories to the extent that judgments were no longer based on a genuine synthesis, but on a blind subsumption. Reification is not easy to define, and I'm sure we're going to return to it many times in later episodes, but I'd like to end by arguing that Adorno comes the closest to understanding the phenomenon and articulates it in a way that can allow conservatives to further understand and engage with the pathologies of the modern world. To do so, we should start interpreting reification as the epistemic pathology whereby regulative structures, fixed identities and instrumental processes encroach on our experiences to the extent that we are unable to look beyond the constraints which we endure. It can be when we passively outsource the attaining of our social needs to technological structures, which make us unable to see opportunities which might be right next to us.
It can be when we are coerced into life ambitions which we only recognise as superficial when it's too late. And it can be when we continue to act in accordance with rational principles, when the fervourance of these principles is so obviously going to come at our own cost. Reification is real. It is a fact about human existence. And quite possibly, the only way we can understand how the strive for abstract universals only leads to us reverting back to myth, fanaticism and self-destruction.